Hey, church family, I'm coming to you this morning, uh, continuing our sermon series entitled Hope Has a Name. You know, this Christmas season, we are embarking, looking at these important names that the, the prophet Isaiah gives to a child that is born unto us. And that child we know to be Jesus Christ. And so we're looking at Isaiah chapter 9 this morning. Now, I know this is not how you and I envision celebrating Christmas uh, this particular season. I know it's not what I wanted. Um, I, I love the way our church looks. I love the songs that we sing. I love the Christmas cheer and the holiday spirit that we bring to this, to this, this time of year. I look forward to it every year. So by the way, don't be surprised if we decide to leave up decorations for an extra week. Uh, just so we can enjoy them together. But anyway, I'm, I'm really grateful to come to you uh, and that God has allowed us the opportunity to do so by way of technology. For all of its shortcomings and even uh, stresses, we're, we're grateful that we can use it uh, for such a positive thing as this. And so Isaiah chapter 9 is where we're going to be this morning. Isaiah 9, beginning in verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. Will you pray with me? Father, we just come to you. God, we're grateful for an opportunity we have to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. God, your son has come on a rescue mission for us. Lord, I pray that as we celebrate this Christmas season, God, that you would bless us. And God, and, uh, God just remind us of, of the true reason for the season. That is, that is the, the salvation that, that this child who would grow up to be a savior. God, who would give his life on a cross, who would step out of a tomb three days later after being crucified to the point of death. God, that we would be reminded of our salvation, that Christmas would be, would be more than just a holiday on a calendar, but God, it would be a reality in our hearts and our lives. God, we thank you. We pray that, you're, that you would take your word and you would encourage us. God, you would convict us and challenge us where we need convicting and challenging. God, and ultimately, God, you would build our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would celebrate you every single day of our lives. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So hope has a name. Last week, we talked about one of the names that hope has, and that name was Wonderful Counselor. We, what we looked at last week is that Jesus Christ is the true north of the world. With, without him, we are in darkness. We are, in, we are directionless. We are, we are wayward. We, don't, we lack purpose and meaning in our lives. And, and Jesus is the bright, shining north star in the world that can lead us to the life that God has intended for us. A life of relationship with God. A life full of hope and, and, and a life of wisdom that God intends as we follow Christ. Well, Isaiah gives us another title, and that title is Everlasting Father. A child is born unto us, for us, and his name is Everlasting Father. Now, here's a disclaimer. As Christians, we believe that we believe in the Trinity. We believe there is one God, and we believe that God, co that God exists, or he coexists in three distinct persons. We, we, we believe in God the Father, we believe in God the Son, and we believe in God the Holy Spirit. And, and Isaiah is not calling Jesus, or he's not calling the Son the Father, but rather what he is saying, that Jesus is divine, he's everlasting, everlasting Father, but, he, but also because Jesus is God, he's calling him that, but also Jesus, he's talking about Jesus' character towards us, that Jesus shows us what God the Father is like. Jesus shows us the fatherly nature of God in relationship to us. That we see God's compassion. We see God's protection. And that's huge for us because one of the areas that we 
that we 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 experience tremendous amounts of darkness and, and we we experience desperation and we need hope it is it is the area of relationships you know that area of relationships is is an area where god shines his light of truth and grace in this area of our lives uh this area is so important because we are social creatures. We are social beings. God created us that way. So, our, so our relationships are interconnected with one another. If my relationship with my coworker is off, it'll affect my relationship with my spouse. If my relationship with my spouse is off, it'll affect how 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 I deal with people in our community or even at work. Um, and so, and, and even if my relationship is off with other people, it can affect my relationship with God and vice versa. My relationship with God, if it, you know, if, if if it's strong or if something's lacking in that it will affect how i treat my spouse or other people so so the horizontal relationships that we have affect the vertical relationship and the vertical affects the horizontal very much connected uh we, it's inescapable uh here and so what we know is that relationships have dark sides that relationships are complex that relationships can be lacking they can be frustrating and they can even be painful and, and so there's often domino effects that happen as one relationship uh, butts up against and, and, and influences another. Maybe there's a friendship in your life that needs to be mended. Maybe there's a marriage that needs to be reconciled or a parent that needs to be reconnected with. Sometimes uh, some relationships feel hopeless. Uh, there's a bridge that was burned by a, by an argument or by an action or there was a persistent attitude that led to that bridge being burned and there's no hope of fixing it, it feels like. Uh, we begin to put up defensive walls towards other people and, and, be, and we do that because we lose the ability to trust. We start to keep people at arm's length because we're hesitant to trust them and we begin to project one relationship failure onto another person or another relationship, whether that's a spouse, coworker, or friend, or even God. One of the most common broken relationships in our lives is that with a father or a father figure. For a lot of people, that particular relationship with a father, it, it, it can be so, uh, so life-giving and encouraging and crucial for development. And for other people, it can be so devastating. And what we know from from just the way God's created the family, just from the way that we, we see human interaction and human flourishing happen, is that a relationship with a father or a father figure is absolutely crucial for human development and flourishing. It's, it's a, it, 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 is a, it is a building block uh, for, for human beings. Now, for a significant number of people, a father or a father figure has brought about a lot of pain in your life. Maybe your father wasn't around, Maybe he abandoned ship when you were young and there's been a void. Maybe he passed away when you were little and you never got to know him. It could be that he was present in your home, but he was just too busy for you, that he felt disconnected. He was present, but he wasn't really connected with you. He didn't pay attention to you. Or maybe your, your interactions were negative. He, maybe you always felt that he was disappointed in you. Maybe you, maybe it was maybe the, the negative interactions were abusive. Maybe that he this father or father figure was physically abusive or verbally abusive or even unfortunately sexually abusive. For whatever reason, there is pain associated with that very particular relationship in our in our society, and it's common for people to project the pain and the failure of a father or a father figure onto other relationships, especially a relationship with God. When you hear the words heavenly father or everlasting father, you dismiss the notion that God is perfect and a loving father because you, you, you can't help but think about how your earthly father was the opposite or is the opposite. It's hard to receive. It's hard to call God father. And studies have shown the impact of our earthly fathers and what, and what they have on our, on our faith in God. And by the way, that's an important reminder that the role that men and, and father and father figures play in the life of their children is crucial. Let me give you some, let me give you some stats here to show you. Focus on the family says that if a father is the first person in the household to come to faith in Jesus, then the household is 93% more likely to, to come to know Jesus Christ and to have their lives changed by him. If, if a mother is, is uh, that first person trying to get their family 
to come to faith in Christ, that number drops from 93% to 17%. And if it's a child in the family, maybe that's come to vacation Bible school. Maybe that, maybe that came to a Wednesday night kids program or a youth group. If it's, if it's a child, then trying to influence their mom and dad and their siblings to come to faith, then that percentage is 3.5%. I hope you see the impact and the importance of a father and a father figure in the life of the family. Someone once pointed out that the most prominent atheists have, have had an either an absentee father or a traumatic relationship with the father. Men like Freud, Nietzsche, Sartre, and David Hume. Beyond faith, dad shaped the area, other areas of, of, of life too. Did you know that 71% of high school dropouts are, are come from fatherless homes? 75% of teens who battle substance abuse also come from fatherless homes. One California school study stated that 98% of their disciplinary issues from young boys uh, come from with, with those young men living in a fatherless home or living from a father wound, having a traumatic or a bad relationship or a negative, negative experience with a dad or a father figure. That, that one relationship can influence and change a whole life for better or for worse. And when, and when it's bad and when it's broken, it creates personal darkness. That our relationships are very impactful on other relationships. And here, and here, but here's the light of Christmas. Here's the hope to every broken relationship, especially broken relationships with authority figures, with fathers, with father figures. And here's the, the light of Christmas for us in our pre-Christ broken relationship with God. God is the father we all long for. The coming of Jesus Christ is a breakthrough. It's a breakthrough in our world. It's a breakthrough in your life. Because in the coming of Jesus, we see the very nature of who God is most clearly. The disciple Philip, one of the 12, asked Jesus and he said, he said, Lord, show us the Father. Show us God the Father. Show us this heavenly Father that we pray to, that you're talking about. Jesus says this in John 14, verses 9 and 10. Have I been with you so long that you still do not know me, Philip? Hmm, interesting little uh, passive rebuke almost there. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And another place in John's Gospel, John chapter 10, Jesus says in verse 30, I and the Father are one. No one understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Verse 38. Hebrews 1 says this. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Well, if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. If you want to know what kind of father you have in the Lord your God, look at Jesus. Jesus says what you see me do. I do because of the Father, John 5, 19. The compa that, here's what that means. The compassion, the mercy, the wisdom, the protection, the healing, all of those things reflect the goodness of our Father in heaven. Jesus is given the role, the title, Everlasting Father, to show us how perfectly, to represent to us perfectly the fatherly nature, the fatherly heart of God towards us. So I'm going to outline for you a few father wounds, some dark places that maybe you have personally experienced in your relationship with your father. Maybe, maybe you've experienced these in other relationships. Maybe it is with a mother or it is with a, with, with, with a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or somebody who has a great role and a great prominence in your life. And I want to show you that how this baby, Jesus Christ, born for us, shines a light and shows us that God is the father we all long for to begin with. Here's what we see. The first one is the first father wound is the never satisfied dad. This is the dad that never seems to be proud of you. Regardless of your grades, your accomplishments, your college choices, or your career choices, 
you never heard approval. So you feel like you have to prove yourself to people. You feel like you have to prove your worth. You feel like you have to compare yourself and show that, that you're enough. And, 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 you, and, you, and you've taken that and you've applied that with your relationship with God. And, you, and you, you view your faith and you think, am I doing enough to earn God's approval? Maybe I need to do more. Maybe I need to do better. Maybe I should be a better worker or a better spouse or a better parent. Then maybe, just maybe, God will be happy with me. That's the temptation that some of us wrestle with. And here, But here's what we see from Scripture. Isaiah 43, verse 4. The Lord is speaking here and, I, and, and says... You are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. Zephaniah 317. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness, and he will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. You may not feel worthy. You may not feel like you've done enough to please your earthly father, but God doesn't operate like that. God is totally satisfied with you as your father in heaven because Jesus Christ satisfied the requirements on or his requirements on your behalf. You see, Jesus was born, a child was born, like Isaiah prophesies here in, in Isaiah 9. A child was born. Jesus, Jesus comes to live perfectly where you and I have sinned and failed. He died sacrificially, satisfying the legal demands for sin so we could be forgiven. So he would pay the cost so we would go free. And he rose again. Your relationship with God, your eternal life, your future resurrection, the hope of your life, the joy of your life, it's all due to grace and grace alone. Christmas is a reminder of how much you matter to God. Jesus came for us. Jesus shows us the love of the Father, that God is in heaven as, as, as a believer. He is singing over you with joy. But the second father wound is the dad with a short fuse. This is the dad who could explode at any moment. It's some days he seems, it seems that things are going okay and he seems all right and that you guys can get along. But then the smallest thing set him off. And when that happens, the abuse begins. You become afraid and fearful. This causes a lot of anxiety in your life. You're always on edge for a potential situation to blow up and get ugly, and you would become the object of that wrath. This fuels how you, how you view God. You think that God is sitting around in heaven, what, critiquing your every move, wait, waiting for the moment that he can lightning bolt you from heaven. When something goes wrong in your life, you automatically assume that you've done something wrong to set God off. But your Father in heaven is not like that. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You know, God is compassionate, not combative towards his children. We have been adopted by faith in Christ. God has went to a great lengths to make, to make us his own children. If God has given up his own son, innocent, to be a sacrifice for us, is God not patient with us in our sin and in our wandering? Is he not patient with the world? I mean, has our world not been in sin for centuries before the birth of Christ? The long-suffering nature, the patient love of God is seen. That he is slow to anger. He's not quick to be enraged. He, he, he's ready to forgive when we repent. He's abounding in faithful, committed love that God, he will discipline us, yes. And as his children, he will do so. But it's with perfect love, not with anger, not with condemnation. He poured out all, the, all our condemnation on Christ on the cross, Romans 8, 1. That there is no condemnation for you or me. That the birth of Jesus shows us that God plays the long game. That our Father in heaven is long-suffering and patient and understanding. He does not have a short fuse with us. He is so incredibly patient in our day-to-day -day walk with him. 
The third father wound is the dad with emotional walls. This is the dad who's around. This is the dad who's present. He is stable and a constant part of your life. But he's not very invested in your life. He's not very affectionate. He's not a hugger. He's not one who just randomly tells you that he loves you. He's got a very hard external shell on the outside. He never says, you're, you're so good at this. I love you so much. Unwarranted. You know, Bo Jackson is one of the greatest athletes in modern American history. And Bo Jackson said this, my father has never seen me play a football or baseball game. Can you imagine? Here I am. Bo Jackson, one of the so-called premier athletes in the country, and I'm sitting in the locker room and envying every one of my teammates whose dad would come in and talk with them and have a drink with them after the game. I never experienced that. You know, we think that it's manly for, for, for fathers to be tough and not to show any emotion, but it's not, it's not manly for fathers to withhold love and to be tough and rugged towards their kids. It's biblical and manly to overwhelm them with love. And that includes, yes, discipline them uh, when, when they need to be disciplined. But we lead our families, we lead our children with love. 1 John 3, 1 says this, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called the children of God. God has bestowed on you a great love. He's not emotionally detached from you. You may, you may have experienced that in your earthly relationship with your earthly father, but your heavenly father is lavishing upon you with love. He's not emotionally disconnected. He doesn't have emotional walls. God is a loving father. And he proved that great love that while we were still sinners, Christ was born for us in order to die for us. So last one, the fourth father wound is the absentee dad. This is the dad who's just not there. Did you know that 2017, a national study was done, 40% of children in America live in fatherless homes. 40%. Children see the absence of their fathers and they take it as, a, as per, personal rejection. They, say, they ask the question, why doesn't my dad want me? What did I do wrong? What's wrong with me? that he doesn't want to be around me. That leads to sadness. It leads to a sadness that is, that, it, that is expressed outwardly by anger. They try to prove their worth by rebelling against authority, showing that they're, that, that, that they're enough. They try to maybe prove, prove, prove their worthiness of their father's presence by athletic accomplishments, maybe sexual acts or sexual deviancy, or maybe acts of violence even. They find that approval in gangs and other unhealthy organizations. Children, especially young boys, look for whatever seems strong and masculine, masculine as a cue to, for how to, how to live their lives. And young girls can struggle to develop self-esteem uh, and, and they crave male attention because they didn't receive healthy, stable love from a present father. Fatherlessness is devastating. And while earthly dads can be absent. Our heavenly father is always present. Hebrews 13, five says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In other words, God is always present. He will never leave. He will never pack his bags and walk away from you. And he will never forsake you. He will never neglect you. As your father, God has made a commitment to be present. You cannot spur him away. You cannot make him love you less. Even when you sin and stumble and fall, God will not pack his bags. He will not run away from you when the going gets tough. When Jesus comes to be born, God made a statement to this world. And he says this, I am here to stay. I'm not going anywhere. Jesus comes to show us that God is the opposite of an absentee dad. God has come running to where we are in our mess. And he comes to running to embrace us 
as his adopted children by faith in Christ. He comes running into the into our dark places with truth and with grace and with and with a, with a fatherly love and compassion and protection. And he wants to lead us and save us and rescue us to places of safety, eternal safety, the salvation of our soul, the transformation of our lives. And he's and he pleads with us to embrace him as a good, good father. As a, as, a, as a perfect and loving father. Relationships are messy. And yet they're so important for life here on earth. Which is why they can be so life-giving. And they can be so crushing to the heart. Like relationships with a father or a father figure. Since we project those relationships, uh, that particular relationship on, other, on others, so many others, including our relationship with God... It's so important that we wrap our minds around this beautiful title that Jesus has been given, Everlasting Father. You know, even, even the best dads disappoint. Even the best dads fall short. And sadly, even the best dads have a limited time that they'll be with us on this earth before they pass on. And the answer to the complexities of those relationships, the answer to the darkness and the confusion that we have in, in, a, in our world of human interaction and human relationships is the birth of a child. It's the birth of a savior. The birth of Jesus is a revelation to the world that Jesus embodies as fully God. He embodies all that God is. He was born to show us the very fatherly heart and nature of God towards us. And even greater than that, he was born to forgive us of our sins and to reconcile us with God the Father. That we don't have to call, we don't have to refer to God as, as if God is distant. But God is personal to us. We can call him our Father. When God is our Father, he's our everlasting Father. We have salvation. We have eternal life. We have security. Let's choose not to judge our Heavenly Father by our earthly relationships, by our earthly fathers. But let's look at Jesus and see the very heart of God, the fatherly heart of God, and let's embrace him and worship him and love him this Christmas season. Hope has a name. That name is Everlasting Father. And he is your father if you know Jesus Christ. So that's the invitation to you this morning. Do you know Jesus Christ? If you don't know Jesus this morning, then the truth is you cannot call upon God and say that he is your father. Because Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the father except through me. So if you're, so if you're joining us this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I am going to encourage you and urge you to pray and confess your sins and repent and say, God, I, I, I know that I'm a sinner, and Lord... God, I, I need a savior. Will you save me? Will you forgive me? And here's the truth of scripture. If you will confess your sins to him, he will, no, he will not cast you away. He will forgive you. And he will, he, he, he will, he will wash you clean and, and he will transform your heart. and He will begin to work in your life, changing you. And as he's restored you to the relationship he's created you for, that can be yours this Christmas season, if you don't know Jesus Christ. God can be your Father. God the Son, Jesus Christ, can be your Savior. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and you can be made new. You can have hope. Hope has a name. That name is Jesus, and a title he bears, Everlasting Father. And if you're joining us this morning and you're a believer, wow, what a precious truth that we have. God is our Father, we are children of the Most High, that our Father is a king. He's a king above every king. He is Lord over the universe. What a wonderful reason to celebrate the birth of our Savior. Because he has come, he has reestablished, reconnected, and reconciled us to God. And we have salvation now and forever. We belong with him. We have hope, church. Hope has a name. It is Jesus Christ, everlasting Father. We see God. We know God. We walk with God. Wonder, wonderful blessing. And it's given to us all by his grace. 
So I pray that you'll be able to celebrate that this Christmas season. Now, before I pray, a couple of reminders. We are still taking up Christmas uh, shoes for Guatemala uh, by December the 19th, I've posted an, another video on Facebook and it'll be on, it's on YouTube. And I would encourage you to go back and watch that. You can give through freedomwatpond.org forward slash give and drop down in the drop box under fund and it will say shoes for Guatemala. Also, since we're not gathering in person uh, today, this Sunday, I'm encouraging you, please make sure you give online or through the same, uh, through the same page or you can send in a check, P.O. Box 1077. Uh, that would be White Pine 37890. And you can, you can mail in your offering uh, as well. And then also we're still taking up Angel Tree stuff that's happening this upcoming Wednesday, Wednesday uh, December the 16th. Please make sure you have that in. We look forward to, to, to being able to celebrate this Christmas season together uh, soon. We're still, you know, we're taking it day by day. We're praying uh, and we're hoping that God will, will, uh, will, will, will show us his healing grace and that, we'll be, that a, lot, a lot of the folks in our community, a lot of folks in our church will be on the road to recovery. I, I'm just praying that today this message has blessed you. And I'm praying that as, as you continue to, 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 to celebrate and just enjoy the festivities in this holiday season, that we would continue to remember that Jesus Christ is the reason for the season. And we are to give thanks. Hope has a name, church, and I don't know about you. In the midst of all the craziness and chaos, I'm still hopeful. I'm still, I'm still clinging to Christ, knowing that he's clinging to me. And that is a, a wonderful blessing to be able to say. So I pray that, that you are blessed. Uh, let, me, let me pray for you, and, uh, and then we we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Let's pray. Father, God be with, God be with us. God, as we go throughout our days, we go throughout our work week, as we're with our families, Lord, may this season be an opportunity we have just to rejoice and give you thanks. God, and point other people to Jesus Christ. God, may this season, this time of openness, God, may, may this time of opportunity not pass us by. But Lord, may we use and leverage Christmas and may we sing uh, on, on the rooftops that a Savior has come and lived and died and lives again. God, we thank you for all that, for, all, for your love and for all that you're doing in our lives. And we pray that you would continue to use us as we, as we draw closer to you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.